Okay, well, that's, uh, thanks Beth for that. That was an excellent overview. And um, I'm not, yeah, I'm gonna kind of repeat uh, some of the things that Beth said uh, in a less eloquent way, but uh, I'm going to, uh, is it too loud? Okay, no, good, it, it's kind of loud. No? Anyway, I'll, I'll speak quietly. <laughs> well, that's fine. So I'm, I'm going to focus on a particular kind of model. So yes, absolutely, there are all kinds of models, from very simple conceptual models to these very complex Earth system models. And so what I'm going to do is uh, follow on and talk about the, the general circulation models that are, are so popular and, and which have become a really important part of, of humans' thoughts about the future and how, how the Earth is going to change going forward as CO2 levels continue to increase. So, but first I'd like to actually, <laughs> this really echoes a lot of the things that Beth just said, uh, just say a few of the reasons why it's important and useful to come up with models. And these are, uh, these are just a few things from a paper by Josh Epstein, who's a, a really imaginative epidemiologist who builds great models. Um, models are great for explaining, because when, when you try to build a model, it's essentially an explanation of observations using math, so using quantitative terms. But it, it's essentially some kind of explanation of the world and an interpretation of the world. It can be useful to guide data collection. We've had a great example of that from Beth. Um, it can be used to illuminate core dynamics. So by trying different explanations, you can find which ones actually seem to capture the, the aspects of the system that you see. And in doing that, you find out which dynamics are the most important in the system you're thinking about. You can also discover new questions. I mean, for me, it, my, the best thing about building models is actually the new questions that come out of it. Um, you just, you're forced to think about the, the system in a quantitative way that really points out the things that you don't know. And maybe the most interesting thing is that you can challenge prevailing theories with your model. If, if you have a model that's based on sound principles that you're pretty confident with, and yet it doesn't match the data, you know that there's something wrong with the prevailing theories. So um, notice I, uh, that here I didn't put up predictions of the future. So I think, so this is one of the things that kind of bugs me about GCMs is that they're often presented as um, like the Wizard of Oz. For those of you who, who know the, this story, but you know, there are these all powerful general circulation models that predict the future. And, you can, uh, you can use them to see what the world is going to be like at a particular point on the coast of somewhere in 100 years. And, you know, I mean, as Dorothy discovered, there's a <laughs> what's behind the curtain does not actually match up to the way that they're sometimes sold. So, so I'd like to quickly go through actually what's behind that curtain. So what, what goes into a GCM? Um, you know, what does it really look like? How do you build one? How do you run it? And rather than think about it as this all-powerful machine, I'd like to just have you think about it as a hamster instead. So quickly go through a GCM as a hamster. So <laughs> I forgot there was a hamster in that, actually. <laughs> actually, actually, I kind of stole this from Dorian Abbott. He, he calls them rubber duckies, but I think maybe hamsters are better. So. Uh, so the, 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 the first part of what goes into a GCM is the code. There are also some parameters that go into it. You have to think about the discretization, something that, that Beth talked about. And uh, also there's boundary conditions. And then once you have all those things together, you just need some initial conditions, and then you can go ahead and integrate the model. So I'll just go through each one of those in turn. So first, the code. The code is essentially the internal structure of the hamster. And I like to think of it as as numerical poetry. So really, when you write code, you're writing equations that are trying to describe something about how th the world is. But just as when you're writing a poem about a forest, you know, you don't, you maybe you spend time in the forest, you think about it, you touch the bark of the trees, you listen to the birds, the cicadas chirping overhead. You think about all these things, you take in all that complexity, and then you just focus on aspects that you're interested in and write a short poem, maybe a haiku. So it's just a, a small number of words that captures the essence of what that, that forest is for you. So code in a model is the same kind of thing. You're, you're trying to capture the essence of what you're most interested in in a small number of terms, trying to make it simple. 
And so those equations are, are what make up the code. And usually, for GCMs, it's written in the high-tech and beautiful poetic verse of Fortran. Um, <laughs> came of age in the 1970s and hasn't really changed. And the code basically starts, it, it takes state variables in the model. So for example, in the ocean, there's the temperature and the salinity of the water. In the atmosphere, there's the moisture content, the, the temperature of the air. All these things are the state variables, so the, the, the code takes the state variables at one point, then it modifies them according to the equations and updates those state variables. So that's what the code does. And you know, this, this poetry is meant to capture fundamental processes when it's possible. So for example, for the equations of motion, for resolved advection in the ocean, those are really pretty fundamental equations. They're, they're pretty right. You can, you can be pretty sure that, that they're correct. You know, do the conservation of mass and Coriolis parameter and those things. But often, you're trying to represent processes that we don't have good fundamental laws for. And so in those cases, um, you use observation constrained approximations. So there's lots of these in GCMs. The GCMs aren't just fundamental physics. There's a lot of stuff that they can't resolve. For example, turbulent mixing at small scales, dissipation of energy. The GCMs do not conserve energy. This was a big surprise to me, <laughs> but, but they don't mass, which is good. But energy is not conserved. And so you, like the dissipation of energy is something that's just kind of this, these ad hoc, you know, observationally constrained things that people spend a lot of time on um, and trying to improve, but that are not fundamental equations. So um, I would like to show you, actually, if this is going to work. Oops. What the, where is that? Over here. What the code actually looks like. <laughs> so, so I work uh, mostly with the GFDL model, because I did my postdoc at Princeton with the GFDL people. And so I, I got to know that model. And the models are so complicated. Once you know one, you don't really want to switch and go to another one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, that's OK. I like this one. It's good. <laughs> and, you know, and actually, something that was, uh, that's interesting in going to a big modeling center is you, you, you f there's like this hive of people. So there they, they're in this big black building that's been there since the 1960s. A bunch of them have been there since the 1960s. And, and the code has also been there since the 1960s. So it's like this you know, symbiotic colony of, of people and code <laughs> that's been gradually evolving over time. And the reason that everybody still uses Fortran is because they're still the same models. People have been working on these same models, improving them gradually. You know, Postdocs come in and out, and PhD students come in and out, and everybody adds their own little piece to the model. But they're really these you know, massive collaborative undertakings that include lots of different people's insights and you know, wisdom and mistakes and <laughs> all of these things together. But so when you use the model, you're really using the ideas of, of hundreds, if not thousands of people that have all contributed to that model over time. So that's pretty cool. Um, but because of it, and also because scientists are not very organized, the code's kind of a big mess. So, so <laughs> well, here's just the, the ocean part of the code. So the ocean for the GFDL model is called, the, called MOM, the Modular Ocean Model. This is version 5 now. So for example, you know, there's things about waves, tracers. Somebody put some blobs into the ocean. Um, here's the core part of the ocean model. So see, it's just all these different Fortran modules. Each one of those F90 things is a different module. And so for example, here's the, here's the main module that calls all of the other stuff. Oh wait, let's show it up on my other screen here. But so. Right, so here's what the code actually looks like. Um, it's just, you know, Fortran text with a bunch of comments <laughs> to kind of explain some things. Some things are well explained, some things are not so well explained. Um, so you can spend a lot of time digging through these things and trying to understand how they work. This, this particular piece of the code has 3,000 lines in it. So maybe we won't go through all of it. You can see here it's setting different variables or these are all the different modules that it can call in the other parts of the model. All right, here's setting up the variables. And then eventually, at some point down here, you get to the actual equations somewhere. This is still just introduction. Oh, uh, yeah. So here, we, yeah, here we've got some equations, changing the thickness, moving blobs around. <laughs> anyway, maybe that's enough. But just to give you an idea that, there's, that this is basically what the models are made up of, 
hundreds of thousands of lines of code by this, uh, like this, run by different people, and all coordinated, um, sometimes better than others. And yeah, any questions about that? Fortran. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Well, and it's also pretty. It's pretty intuitive, I think, for scientists. I mean, it's it's called. I mean, it, I mean, it was formula translation. I think was the original name because it was for doing chemical equations. So that's actually pretty intuitive to read. I find it's just kind of ugly. And real computer scientists make fun of you. Right, so that's the code. Okay, but the code is not the whole model. Not really, because it, it needs parameters in order to run. So because all these equations are filled with constants, the choices of those constant values have a big impact on what the model does. So you know, that's kind of like, you can start off with the same insides, but get a very different looking hamster, depending on what you pick for your parameters. And the parameters are never perfectly known. You know, there's some kind of um, observational, oops, observational guess that you can start off with, or maybe some kind of value for each of your constants in the model that are you could get from theory. But then when you put those into the model and you run the simulation and then compare the output to observations, you invariably end up with disappointment. And so following that, you then adjust one or more of the uncertain parameters because you think, ah, I just have to change this one like this, and it's going to make the model work much better. And then you repeat the simulation and, again, feel disappointment. And you can continue that loop over and over again for the rest of your life, actually. <laughs> but hopefully, <laughs> most, most of the time, you stop after just going through it a few times because it's, uh, it, it's never perfect. So that's the parameters and the, the tuning of parameters. Um, Beth already talked about this part, but this is another por important part of defining a model is how you discretize it. So the, I mean, the, the root idea of a, a GCM is that you, you, you split up the fluid of the atmosphere, or the ocean, into a finite number of particles, essentially boxes. And y you solve all the same equations, so the code does the same thing usually in every one of those grid cells. So it's called a grid. So you have finite volume or maybe finite mass. And obviously, the, the smaller you make those boxes, the better a job it's going to do, because you can represent smaller scale processes. But the trade-off is that the model becomes more expensive, because you have to run the equations inside each one. So you can think of this as being the difference between a small hamster and a big hamster. Um, and as Beth talked about, one way that you can get around this is by running regional models that are high resolution within a, a larger coarse resolution model with all the parts that you're not interested in. That can work very well at times, but you have to be careful with that because it's kind of like just trying to simulate one leg of the hamster by itself without the rest of it. So you have to be very careful with how you connect that leg <laughs> to the rest of the hamster that's missing. So what you do with the edges. And this brings us to boundary conditions, which are also an important part of any model. So the, you know, the, the, things that the, the things that the code is trying to solve, the equations that the code is solving, often require inputs that are not contained within the model. So they depend on, on variables that are not state variables. So things that the model doesn't itself know about, things on the outside. So you need to tell it about those. So for a global model, for example, you need to tell it about the solar forcing, because it's not doing solar physics in the model, so you have to include the topography. It's usually not doing plate tectonics or anything at the same time, so you have to tell it what the shape of the basin is. Um, and for most of the models that are using, they, they prescribe the CO2 concentration. So usually when they do the future projections, they're telling the model what the CO2 is doing going into the future. And those are all different boundary conditions. So like putting your, so you've, you've got your model and you're forcing it to do different things by changing those boundary conditions. So I'll just show you one example of a, uh, an exciting model that I've, I've been working with a bit, um, which is a, a new model from the GFTL called CM2.6. And you can think of this as being a really large hamster because it's... Uh, is this going to work? Right. Yeah, this is a, 
this, this is, I think it's still the, the highest resolution global simulation that's been run for a, a time of more than a century. Um, so they have a good graphics department at GFDL. So just to give you an idea of how big a, a tenth of a degree grid cell is. So this is a global model that runs the entire ocean at one tenth of a degree, coupled to a half degree atmosphere, which is a reasonably high resolution atmosphere. And so it's coupled so that the, you know, the atmosphere is changing. Every, I mean, the time steps for this are quite short. I think the atmospheric time steps are just a couple minutes. The ocean time steps are also a couple minutes. So it's doing a ridiculous number of calculations. This was, uh, they ran this on, I think, 20,000 processors at Oak Ridge, and it's, it only got, even with 20,000 processors, it could only do about one and a half years per day. So it's very, very expensive. They ran it for hundreds of years, but it, it makes very pretty pictures. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. It's just this. Yeah. They're in New Jersey, so it's centered on New Jersey. <laughs> so, so it is a global model. Actually, if you, if you go to the GFDL website, they have another video that I couldn't manage to download, but that actually goes around the world. Yeah, yeah. But it is, you know, so it is, the, everything is being affected by what's happening everywhere else in the world in this model. And it's continuous, so there, you don't have to do anything forcing the boundary conditions. Everything can change everywhere. So, you know, one butterfly flaps its wings on the other side of the world, and that can affect what's happening in the deep ocean somewhere else. It's all fully connected from the bottom of the atmosphere, or the top of the atmosphere to the bottom of the ocean. So, yeah, so that's cool. Well, so, th yeah, so this is still pretty, this one is still experimental. But I think uh, but they'll head in this direction, so there will be more and more simulations at this, this resolution. And what's great about this is that you can, you can really start to get coastal upwellings, which are important for us. So, so this one is um, just pre-industrial control. So that's just constant forcing. So they did that, and then they also did an idealized 1% CO2 increase to doubling just because that's a standard experiment that people have been doing for decades. And uh, it gets you to doubling pretty quick. And they hold it constant. I don't know, not yet, actually. That one's still pretty new. So they're still using it for research. They haven't made that one public yet. I don't know if they will make that one public. But there, there will definitely be more simulations at that resolution coming out in the future. Yeah, for sure. And, I, and actually, the data, for, I mean, the output for that is so huge <laughs> that it's really, really hard to work with, actually. I mean, each year of that model, the output is over two terabytes. So it's very difficult to work with. Yeah, you can work on the, over the internet, but it's a pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a pain. I mean, of course, you can downscale it, so you, you could subsample it just if you wanted particular areas, and then it's easier to work with. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. And um, and and that that'll, that's definitely that'll happen more in the future for sure. Oops. Right. So next, I wanted to show you quickly how you run these things. You know, these uh, super um, high-tech, state-of-the-art circulation models. So. What do you do? So you go to your, your terminal and your terminal window and you log into your supercomputer. So I think I'm so I'm logged in here to the this the cluster I run things on in uh Toronto in Canada. And then you take your run script. So so here's the run script for the, the model that I usually run. So this is actually the same code as that CM two point six model. So same code, same parameters. Similar boundary conditions, but I run it at three degrees resolution instead of a tenth of a degree resolution. <laughs> so it's, uh, I don't know, like four orders of magnitude cheaper or something. Uh, but so if we wanted to run a simulation here, I guess we'd, we could uh, change the name. We want to pick a name for a simulation. Shanghai. I like so this. Shanghai. 
Wait, what was the other one? Hamster. Oh, oh yeah, maybe, maybe hi, hi. let's call it Shanghai Hamster. <laughs> Oops. Oh, except yeah. See, this is a ma this is a large problem in modeling it's typos. And then I need to save this. Oops. Uh oh. Wait. Oh, shoot, it dropped my connection. Huh. The internet is a little bit slow here. Okay, so, so now, um, and we could, uh, we could change something in here. So if we wanted to change something in this model, so this run script here is gonna point to some code. Uh, so here's there's an executable that's compiled that's ready to go. It's got some initial conditions. So those are just standard temperature and salinity observations, World Ocean Atlas for the whole ocean with biogeochemistry. This has got a biogeochemistry module. This just t tells it how long it's going to run for. It's going to do annual chunks. This is just a bunch of the loading modules, setting up some just Unix things, moving some files around. And then this tells it what diagnostics to run to write out in the output. There are literally thousands and thousands of things that you could write out from all the different parts of this model. So you don't write out all of them. But, you know, these are all different parts of the model that uh, we might be interested in looking at. And then you set up how it's going to mix the ocean parts that it can't resolve. And then some extra tracers. And then here, finally, we get to the parameter values. So down here are the 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 some of the parameters. So this is an incomplete list of parameters that you might want to change at runtime. So you always have to be very, very careful that you don't accidentally change one of these parameters because you'll end up with a different hamster. And then maybe something that we might want to change is maybe the CO2 concentration. So we could look for, let me see, the CO2. Okay, so here's the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. So right now it's set to 270 parts per million. Want to change the CO2 concentration to something else, maybe? What should we go for? Pick a number. 600. Okay. Okay, so 600. So there we go. So now it's 600. Now it's going to save that on the server, hopefully. And then we can go to the server. And we just submit it. <laughs> oh, Shanghai hamster. There we go. Woo! It's submitted. So now that script will run on the computer, hopefully. Hopefully it shouldn't crash. We just changed one thing, so it should be fine. And then what you have to do is you have to check up on your, on the things that you have in the queue. I've got a few other jobs running, but there it is. So Shanghai Hamster is now submitted. It's in the queue. And uh, you can check back on it later and see what it does with 600 ppm in the atmosphere. So that is it. That is how you run the state of the art GCM model. <laughs> Not very Star Trek. Okay. I still have a couple minutes left. So actually, so the next part I was going to talk about, uh, Beth already covered pretty well. So I'll go through it pretty quickly. But um, mostly what I've been doing is, is trying to understand ocean biogeochemistry through direct coupling in, in GCMs. Because that's a fun thing to do. And the idea is that you start with this ocean GCM that's predicting the physical environment of the ocean. Uh, and the things that it predicts that are important for life are the, the light, how much photosynthetically active radiation is coming in, what the temperature of the water is, and what the ocean circulation is. And those first two things in particular are very well done by these models now. The models are very good at getting the light, mixed layer depth, correct, sea surface temperature. Those things work pretty well in, in most of the models. Circulation is, is more tough. 
But so this really makes a, like a, a toy physical environment that you can then embed virtual living things within. So if we want to first grow a virtual phytoplankton, we can, just like with the, all the other equations, we can embed you know, numerical poetry for the phytoplankton within each grid cell. So if you uh, want to know what's going on with the phytoplankton, you need to predict the growth. So you can start off usually with some maximum growth rate for the phytoplankton. So that's a parameter value. And then you give it, usually everybody uses the same kind of temperature relationship. So there's just an exponential um, you know, increase in growth rates with temperature. And then you need some kind of light limitation. So in general, the, the light limitations just go between zero and one. And some kind of function so that as the light increases, you get faster growth rate. At some point, it saturates or maybe slows down a bit. And then what else do you need? What else would you need for phytoplankton on top of that? Nutrients, exactly. So we know very well that, that phytoplankton growth rates are, are strongly limited everywhere in the ocean by nutrients. So here's a, here's a map of nitrate concentrations at the surface of the ocean. And actually, I really like this, uh, this compilation of uh, data that's in this um, paper by Moore et al. Because the, so, so shown here are nutrient assay experiments. So these are places where people actually went out in the ocean and took phytoplankton and added nutrients to see what they would respond to. And there's this really nice division between nitrogen-limited points, which are shown here in green, and iron-limited points that are shown here in red. So there, there aren't really any nutrient assays in the literature, apparently, that, that show other primary nutrient limitation. It's really nitro nitrogen or iron limitation everywhere in the surface ocean. And it's really well split between places where nitrate is high, where iron is limiting, and places where nitrate is low, where nitrogen is limiting. So I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. So that's a, a great thing to put in, into models. And we know it's very important for controlling growth. So we include. Uh, nutrient limitation terms, usually people use the same form, michaelis menten enzyme saturation form, which is the concentration of the nutrient over a half saturation constant, so another parameter, plus the nutrient concentration. And this is just a simple equation that goes from zero to one, you know, again, saturating. It doesn't look that different than the equation beside it, actually. And so that's a very common form for the nutrient limitation. And here I've just put nitrate, but you can do the same thing for iron. And that's the way, that's the way it's usually done. So that gives you your growth, but then, of course, you need to know how the nutrients are affected by the growth of the phytoplankton, so you need to have uptake of the nutrients. And you can't go directly from growth to uptake without also knowing the biomass of the phytoplankton. So you have to take into account how the phytoplankton biomass changes over time, which is the difference between growth and mortality, which is generally grazing by, by zooplankton or, or fish. So you keep track of how the phytoplankton change over time, and then when you know the biomass and the growth rates, you can calculate the uptake rate of the nutrients from the same grid cell in each time step. And then once you have that uptake with that growth and the, the grazing term, you can see how the phytoplankton break down into either dissolved organic matter or sinking particulate organic matter, and then you can tell the sinking particulate organic matter to sink down through the grid cells of the water column so it's distributed down below it, even the same time step, or you can have actually particles that explicitly sink. And then you can get the ocean circulation part of the model to tell you how all of those things move around. So you can calculate all the, that biological part, and then at the end of the time step, the eviction and mixing of the model moves the concentration of that tracer a little bit between all of the grid cells. And then that's it. That's basically how you, you build a lower trophic level biogeochemical model. And then you can build onto that other dissolved things in the water. So dissolved inorganic carbon, alkalinity, dissolved oxygen concentrations, etc. And so actually we put a very simple biogeochemical model into that CM2.6 simulation. Um, we had to make it very simple because it's so expensive because of the high resolution. Uh, but it, it only does three tracers, but one of them is oxygen. So this, this shows what the oxygen concentration looks like in that very high-resolution model simulation at, uh, I think this is 200 meters. And you know, this, is, this is not 
a correct simulation of oxygen in, in all respects. There are a number of problems with this. For example, the oxygen, the models almost always do this. They put the oxygen too low in the Bay of Bengal versus the Arabian Sea. I don't know, I still don't know why they do that. But there's a lot of really interesting things that you see by running this model at this very high resolution, which is higher than before. For example, all this, this turbulent activity on the edge of the subtropical gyre. There's these really cool wisps that we've never seen before. We were kind of surprised by those. And you can see these strong tropical instability waves uh, really changing oxygen in the Pacific there. So, so that's fun. So you can learn a lot by watching these movies, actually, and, and seeing kinds of variability here that are at scales that we can't actually observe um, easily. That's fun. And, so, and then people make these models more complicated, as Beth also talked about before. So people put in multiple phytoplankton functional types with different parameter values. Um, different, you can put in a couple of types of zooplankton with more complex grazing if you want. Most, most of them now include iron cycles. Some include silica cycles, so you can do di diatoms. And multiple dissolved organic pools. Many include denitrification and nitrogen fixation, so that you have an open nitrogen inventory. And actually, very few allow the stoichiometry to vary. Most models use fixed redfield stoichiometry. And I, I would actually think that's one of the biggest uncertainties in most of the biogeochemical models today. It's, it's, uh, they still rely on, on fixed stoichiometry, which is certainly wrong. We know that that one's wrong. But it's just it's tough to get away from that one. So one of the things that we've already heard a bit about, but um, it's, it's a very useful recent development, is the public availability of biogeochemical simulations as part of the CMIP-5. And I put this in the, the suggested readings, this uh, overview paper by Laurent Bopp and many other people that came out in Biogeosciences last year that compares different aspects of these GCM embedded biogeochemistry models. And I put this up, um, <laughs> this is a, this gives you a pretty good sense of how these models are doing for a number of parameters. So these are Taylor diagrams. If you're not used to looking at these, these uh, it's a nice way to look at both the correlation uh, along this way and the standard deviation for a bunch of different things at the same time. So the idea is that you have you know, some observed standard deviation in the ocean. So for example, how much SST varies. So SST here is shown in blue for all the different models. So there's a certain range of SST, so a certain standard deviation of SST and observations. If you get that right, perfectly right, you sit on this line here. And then the correlation, so how well you fit that variability spatially with the observations is shown on this by the radial around this way. So a perfect model sits right here at this point. And the further you get away from this point, you know, going out like this, the worse the model gets. So you can see the models are doing pretty well for SST, and they're doing not so bad for oxygen between two and 600 meters. So like that movie I just showed you. So in general, they're doing okay for those things. But then when you go to other things like net primary productivity, which could be important for ecosystems and marine biogeochemistry, you see that they're actually all doing pretty badly. They're all sitting up here. So they're, they're generally they're having too much variability and it's not very well correlated with the observations. And, and it's kind of interesting that the models tend to actually cluster together. So they all do badly for the same kinds of things. Which maybe we can come back to you. And here's another view of that. Here, this is comparing chlorophyll. So these are maps of chlorophyll and observations, so from sea whiffs in the upper left, and then compared to the GCM estimates and all these other ones. And you can see, you know, there's some features of reality that they're getting and many that they're not. <laughs> so, and that's okay, I mean, chlorophyll is pretty tough because you have variability in the chlorophyll to carbon ratio, you have to get the biomass right, which requires you getting the growth and the de decay, you know, the, the grazing right. So yeah, you gotta get a lot of stuff right to get chlorophyll. And if you look at the R's here, I don't know if you can see those, but those are R's, not R squared. I think the highest is 0.61. So less than, much less than 50% of the variability. So not so hot, actually. So take these things with very, very coarse, kosher grains of salt, I think, at this point. And 
the disagreement also extends into the future projections. So this is showing from that same paper, um, actually pretty good agreement for global oxygen content change. That's because this is largely driven by temperature. Also, it's stratification, and bo both the models, or all the models tend to do that pretty well. But when you look at primary productivity, there's a huge range. So going from some of the models that show zero change going forward to 2100, and some that show quite a substantial decrease in primary productivity. So who knows which one is right? It's, uh, it's, that's, it's still an important question. So why do these things look so bad? Beth already touched on these, but I, I would say that for these models in general, there's four main sources of errors. So the first one is bugs, actually. <laughs> so there could be mistakes in some of these models. People just, everybody makes mistakes, and sometimes they're hard to catch. Most of these models are pretty good. So I, I, they, they, people work very hard on catching bugs in these big models run by, by dozens or hundreds of people. So that's probably not so big. Another thing is that equations or parameters can be incorrect. So you're, you're using an equation that's wrong or your parameter values are not right. That certainly contributes to it. I think probably actually even more important for these biogeochemical ones are that equations are missing. So there's things that are happening in the marine ecosystem that we just don't understand. I'm, I think everybody who works <laughs> in observations would agree with this. And so, I mean, the, the ocean is complicated. The ecosystem is complicated. And we can't model things that we don't understand. So there's definitely still large gaps in our knowledge of how things work. And then there's also the resolution question. So many things happen at, at small scales. A lot of the physics is at small scales. And if we don't resolve those because of the course discretization, the SEMA 5 models are one degree, so they don't get coastal upwelling. Really? doesn't really exist in these models. So um, you also can't predict things that you can't resolve. And then, okay, finally, I just wanted to say a couple quick things about uh, other things that, that Beth already touched on, but just some, some other things, that other ways that people are looking at things, new directions. This is, a, I think, a cool model from Mick Follows group at MIT. I think, basically, Mick just got tired of trying to tune his own parameters in the model to make the phytoplankton look right. So rather than pick the parameter values, he instead hundreds of different phytoplankton into the circulation model, each one with a random assortment of parameters, and then just let them evolve, you know, into, uh, so that the parameter values that didn't work would go extinct, and the parameter values that worked well would colonize their particular part of the ocean. So what you can see is that uh, this is just a, a partial snapshot of, you know, the end of that simulation, where you, after you ran this for 100 years or something, and you can see that many of the different parameter values for the different types of simple numerical phytoplankton were at very low concentrations, whereas other ones did pretty well. So, and what, what's kind of interesting is that these ones are the ones that look kind of like Perchlorococcus, the ones that sit out in the middle of the gyres. And this is probably, I think this is one that looks more like diatoms, that grows rapidly in high latitude regions. So that, that's kind of a cool direction. They're doing lots of fun stuff with that model. Uh, something we've been working on is, is looking at, at animal movement within models. So particularly we were focusing on the deal vertical migration of zooplankton and fish. So as these things you can see very well in uh, acoustic backscatter, the daily upward and downward motions as things swim down to a few hundred meters depth at night in order to hide from predators. So we just put that in a simple way into one of these embedded models, uh, splitting up the, the normal particle remineralization from being a, you know, a sinking, this, this uniform sinking, just particles sinking down into the ocean, into the majority being at sinking particles, but also having a vertical migration component. And we split this up into a swimming part, so where the vertical migrators are swimming up and down, and how much they respire and metabolize as they're doing that, but also the part where they sit down at depth um, during the daytime, just metabolizing away at their, their stationary daytime depth. And what was kind of surprising about this was that it turns out that the oxygen that they consume while they're sitting down at the stationary depth, even though it, it's a very small part of the total export from the surface, I think we use 15% of the, of the total export going into the stationary DVM, it ends up being quite significant for the oxygen budget at those depths because these depths are relatively poorly ventilated in much of the ocean. So they're basically going from this very busy active surface layer where they make up a small part of the total, but then they're going down into this very quiet subsurface water where they respire. So when you add it up globally, you find out that actually 
the vertical migrators can be contributing a significant part of the oxygen consumption in the upper thermocline, and particularly around oxygen minimum zones, which is pretty cool. So maybe something like 30% of the total oxygen consumption in the upper parts of oxygen minimum zones may actually be from animals rather than sinking particles, which is the more classical view, and which gives potential feedbacks between um, fish and changes in fish abundance and actually the, the chemistry of the ocean, which is fun. And then, uh, right, there's a lot of, there's exciting work, as Beth already talked about, so I won't go through this again, but putting fish into models. Um, the, the, the French group is doing great stuff. They're, they're really moving ahead quickly. We're also working on this, actually, with a kind of a simpler model. You know, as Beth said, there, there are many types of models that you can build. There's no one model that can do everything. And we've been working on a simple model to look at this question that Rashid talked about yesterday, just the, the global um, catch of wild fish. And so I have a PhD student, David Carrazza, who's actually at the last Climico summer school, but who has been, who's put together uh, the bioeconomic open access trophic size spectrum model, which basically, you know, just as I talked about, takes the, it's embedded within each grid cell. It calculates a resource spectrum from the primary productivity of the lower trophic level model and then splits it between four groups, each one of which has a mckendrick von forster advection of biomass through the spectrum. And then uh, uh, there, there's some recruitment based on the, the biomass of adults. And then this is coupled to uh, fishing effort. So we do this within each grid cell. And it's an idealized kind of model. You know, we don't resolve fleets or anything or different gear types. It's really just how much stuff could, could theoretically be predicted from some kind of metabolic theories and, and uh, with a simple open access fishing model. We lump all the different species together and we don't resolve any movement or anything. And the, uh, the effort is just predicted from simple economics, so just the difference between revenue and, and cost changes over time. But what's kind of fun is that it does a, a, a pretty reasonable job of getting the distribution. It gets about 60% of the, the spatial variability between large marine ecosystems. And you can make plots that have dollars per square meter per year, which I was excited about. And, and actually, um, it can do, uh, it, c it can produce the same shape <laughs> as in the observations. That doesn't mean it's a unique way to produce the same trend as in the, the, the real world. But, you know, it does, we do find that, but just by increasing technology over time, and here also including climate change, that it produces this, uh, inc this increase and in leveling off of fish harvest. Um, at about present time. So, to summarize, so these general circulation models, I would say, produce Earth-like planets with oceans that bear some similarity to ours. They're not accurate, <laughs> but they can host numerical life and biogeochemistry to simulate some aspects of the marine ecosystem and links to humans, as we've talked about. It's very, very exciting, I think. These models, I think I would say they can provide reasonable guesses about the future, but they are wrong in important ways. And so I think we can learn from them. They're extremely useful tools, but we should always be careful and beware the Wizard of Oz's who try to tell you that they're real. But I mean, I think to me, I think the, the, the best thing about the models is that they're internally consistent systems. They summarize our understanding. So the ways that they're wrong reflect things that we don't understand about the world so they can help us help guide what we need to learn it more about. They facilitate mechanistic experiments and they can reveal emergent properties when you put in two things that you know, understand well and a third thing comes out that's a surprise to you. They're very useful for that. And they can also illustrate hypotheses, things that you didn't think of, which you can then go out and test with the data. So that's it. Thanks. It's the first time I see a dollar map. Can you show, can you show again the map and see and tell us what it's showing? Uh oh, you're going to tell me that the <laughs> that the income you're spending is not right. <laughs> <laughs> so this is very simple. So we don't. I mean, I mean, Rashid showed so much more 
uh, complex results yesterday that include different prices. So we just use one price for everything, actually. So it's just one X vessel price. One fish, one price, all the other Exactly. That's right. So, so the spatial distribution here is certainly wrong. I mean, the reason we did that, initially we were going to take different prices, but when we looked in the see around us project, I mean, the average, we're just doing it by size. Everything here is size. We're not doing individual species. And when you look at the X vessel prices for different sizes since 1950, they fluctuate, they bounce around, but there's, it's not consistent that there's a, a difference between large and small because there's shrimp that screw everything up, right? It, it's, and there's no trend in the price over time. There's, there's a big change in the 70s because of the oil problem, you know, they, they jump up and down, but... So, so that's why we chose to do it this way. And, and I mean, I think a, a lot of that is because of the complexities of the, the fish market. I mean, I, th I think it must be that a lot of people just want fish, and they don't care what kind of fish it is. <laughs> and overall, a dollar a kilo is what people will pay the world over, on average, since 1950. Yeah? Of course, yeah. It's still in the works. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we should. This is in, in lamb, I think. Is that yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, right. We, yeah, we've looked at that. But yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, great, great. But really, I mean, our, well, our hope here is really to look at processes rather than predict things exactly. Yeah, Elida. <coughs> yes? Yeah. Well, the O2, actually, the O2 is also from the biogeochemical model. Because the oxygen, I mean, there's a small production of oxygen in the surface. But it mostly gets wiped out by equilibration with the atmosphere. But then the oxygen is consumed everywhere in the ocean interior. So that, that also includes the, uh, the biology. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's a good question. I haven't actually seen, I mean, usually people show like a map of their phytoplankton concentration and then they show a map of satellite chlorophyll and they say, hey, that looks pretty good. I mean, there's not actually very much, you know, statistical analysis of, of how well the models are doing and I haven't seen any at regional scales. So I don't know the answer to that question. I would guess that they can do better because they're probably capturing the physics better and because people tune the parameters specifically for, their, for the observations in their region, which, so you, which I mean, presumably you have a smaller diversity of organisms and you should be able to pick better parameter values. So I would guess that you can do better, but I don't actually know. I haven't looked at that. I, yeah, I always stick to the whole hamster. I never look at the regional things. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a, a, an avenue that's worth exploring because phytoplankton wrong, whether it's satellite estimates, you know, there's huge uncertainty, our model estimates aren't very good, and yet it's a fundamental building block for everything else that we look at from, from our couple of models. So, yeah, no, I agree. That, yeah, that's probably, that probably would be a, a good avenue to go in. Yeah, it's a good suggestion. Okay. <laughs>